Holy Spirit, come, be present here among us. Help us to know what it is to be brothers and sisters and to not be afraid to explore the faith we share and the love we are all called to. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So today I want to reflect together with you on the story of Joseph from Genesis. And I'll review it later in this sermon. Uh, we got part of it today in our lesson. And I want to invite us to wrestle together with how it is that God is at work in our lives. In spite of ourselves, how God works in every moment, no matter the decisions we've made or the blindness we have, works with us to weave together our experiences, trusting that God is present and to weave it into a better present and a better future. How God works for our healing, for our restoration, and for reconciliation. So first, a story. There was this Iowa farm boy, grew up in a county in Iowa, he, he believes there were never any black people, so grew up and went to school with people who looked a lot like him. It was a part of Iowa that was inhabited by folks, many of whom came from Scandinavian countries, it was several generations back, and you know, farmed. So um, this Iowa farm boy went to the State University and then went on and furthered his education, ending up in Minneapolis. And so in Minneapolis, he became aware that there were, well, it was a more diverse community. And he kind of leaned into that and he liked it. And he and his wife uh, moved into a diverse community, lots of black folks, some American Indians, and some white folks too. His children went to school. He was feeling pretty good about himself, even in his church. You know, there were folks of many different sort of origins and, and colors even. And so his church invited him to do some work with the homeless. So he, he would go down into the city of Minneapolis and and engage in conversations and be a part of their homeless ministry. And it was there, this, this farm boy's name was Frank, and it was there where Frank met Les. Les was among the people who lived on the streets in Minneapolis. And so while Frank befriended Les, one of the first lessons he learned from Les was that Les wasn't homeless. So when he described him as homeless and began a relationship, Les was very quick to say, well, you might call me houseless, but I'm not homeless. My home is over there in that tent under the bridge. So Les was of, of Indian, American Indian descent. He was a Lakota. And so they, uh, they became friends over a number of years. They taught each other lots of things, but mostly Frank would say he learned from Les. So one of the things he learned from Les was where Les came from. And he asked Les in a really honest way among friends, now how do you think that you sort of ended up here on the streets? Because Les seemed pretty smart and he had some other sort of gifts. He wasn't antisocial or, or whatever. So, and so Les told the story of the people of his, of his tribe. He told the story of his great-grandfather having lived in a tribe that was in Nebraska, and that when the United States government decided to literally move tribes out of Nebraska land because they were aware that they could attract new settlers there, that their family and their traditions began to fall apart. So while his family moved from, you know, from the Lakota, from that area in Nebraska to a Lakota reservation, and then they were sort of scattered, and somehow now, two and a half generations later, he ended up in Minneapolis. So Frank said, you know, that's really interesting because my great-grandfather came from Sweden and the first place he settled was on some land in Nebraska. Well, they got to talking. They discovered that the current county in Nebraska, 
wherein they both have roots was the same. Then they actually went looking for deeds. And literally, two years after Les's family was shuttled off and into a, a small reservation, Frank's grand, great-grandfather bought land. His great-grandfather actually inhabited the land that our government had taken from Les's great-grandfather, and he sold and lived on that. They, they sold it to him, and then they, they developed. So then they talked about, well, how are our lives different? We're about the same age, and we have this heritage, and they became very aware of what it meant that the kind of assets that Frank's family was able to build up over two and a half generations left him as an incredibly well-educated person in, um, in Minneapolis and left less as a houseless person living on the streets. Now I tell you this story because the lesson we heard from, the, from Genesis about Joseph is often understood to be a lesson about how God takes circumstances that we're in and that may be unjust and even evil and they become good. And the first thing I want to do is dispel you of some notion. I, I sometimes hear Christians talk about God's plan, right? We've all heard that, right? And, and there's some parts about that that are very good. We get a sense that God knows us and knows our life. But the part that I want to say really challenges me is when I find some of my evangelical brothers and sisters weaving together a narrative about how some things happen in our lives, and they may be incredibly painful, may be hurtful down to two or three or four generations, but somehow that these injustices or these evils are necessary for God to accomplish some larger purpose. Get scared if you hear that theology. My son Peter in high school had a couple of friends that were in evangelical churches and so he went off with one of his friends to church. I think he was in the ninth grade. In fact, I remember it because of sort of what ensued. It was in the 90s, and at the Bible study in the Friends Church, they opened up and looked in the back of the Bible, and while the Bible study was going on, Peter read about the AIDS epidemic. And in the back of their Bible was this little sheet that said the AIDS epidemic was brought by God in order to punish some people, particularly homosexuals, and that, in fact, in one of the questions was sort of, well, what about people who had blood transfusions and they're dying too? And the theology was, oh, well, that's just the cost of God accomplishing God's purpose. I didn't know for a year, but Peter was like scared. It's no wonder he decided that year not to be confirmed. He was so scared of church, and he didn't even ask me about it for a whole year. But I found out later the artwork in school that he was doing and the, and the um, stories he was writing in English class were all about this kind of, I'm gonna call it what I believe it is, bogus theology. So that's not what we're talking about here. We're not, the God I know is not a God who creates hurt, evil, or injustice in order to do something else. The Jesus I know would only ever be asking all of us as disciples to take a look at what we're doing and the structures we're functioning in and the waters we're living in and to be able to notice how what we're doing and we might be doing individually or collectively is actually harming others. To dare to ask us to look at our government and say what might our government be doing to go against the very heart of the gospel that calls us to love one another as brothers or sisters, to treat each other with respect, and if you listen to that gospel today, to even turn the other cheek or give away your shirt if someone wants your coat. So in the story of Joseph, there's a lot to reflect on about our sinfulness and our humanity and our capacity to miss the mark 
or do destructive or cruel things. The story basically is about this uh, group of brothers, 12 brothers, who are the sons of Jacob. Now, Jacob had essentially four wives. Two of them weren't really called wives, they were probably called concubines, and, and two were sisters who were wives. But out of that, he had 12 children, and he had two, the youngest, that were the favorites. So that was Benjamin and Joseph. And so as brothers will be brothers, or siblings will be siblings, they didn't all get along. And Joseph and Benjamin were from his favorite wife, right? And so they were his favorites. So um, probably the father may not have noticed his own prejudice in favor of those two. Um, maybe, um, maybe the two, Benjamin and Joseph, didn't really notice that they were so favored. They, they might have even thought they deserved it because they were probably better than the others, right? The story says Joseph was a little full of himself. Um, and his brothers had had it about up to here with him. So when they were out on a little adventure, they just sold him into slavery, into slavery in Egypt. And then they were so devious that they, they got some animal blood and wiped it on something and they, told their, they went home and told their father that he had been eaten by a wild animal. They kept that secret too, together, because they all did it together. Have you ever kept a secret and realized the burden it is? I mean, those brothers, I have to believe they had nightmares. I mean, for years. And I have to believe that that father had some hint of what was going on. That Jacob thought, you know, there's something suspicious about this story. And yet, you know, all he had left were these other sons, and so he was afraid to think, of what, to think about what they might have been capable of. And so the story, when we get it today, it's, a, it's a very condensed, but, but, but basically there's a famine in the whole area. And by the time Joseph has gone, to, has gone to Egypt, he actually became a famous person in Egypt. And although a person that was a Hebrew, and that's what we would have called it in the Old Testament Bible, he, he became elevated in Pharaoh's courts and became a really important person. So, so there he was, but he, he, he got brought out of prison because he, he knew how to interpret dreams, and he became a trusted person. Meanwhile, um, jo uh, Joseph's brothers and his father and his whole family over there in Canaan land, they were, they were starving. So the father said, you need to go over to Egypt where they have stores of grain, and you need to get some food for all of us. And so when, when this band of brothers came over to Egypt, Guess who it is that they had to present their case for needing grain to? Their brother. They didn't recognize him at all. So it's a longer story than that too, but basically um, today's lesson was when, when Joseph reveals himself to them and says, I am your brother. And then in the lesson says, you know, and don't worry. And even then, there's this part of the story where they're trying to wrap their minds around, is this the one that got sold into slavery? And in fact, he says, that is who I am. And essentially says, and I think it was for good. I think it was for good because now, here I am in a position to help my own family and to help them not starve. And the story progresses and, and the entire family then comes down and lives in Egypt, right? So, and the lesson is always understood and talked and practiced by, uh, by Christians as sort of what God intended for evil became good. But don't confuse it with that other theology, that somehow God wanted those jealous brothers to sell Joseph into slavery, that somehow God intended that Joseph be the favored son and therefore end up in this situation with his brothers, that somehow God intended any of that. So it's important to remember, too, that this remnant in the tribes of Israel, you know, so this remnant that lived in Egypt, the story is an ongoing story. And in fact, after living there 40 years, they no longer had someone in Pharaoh's court to look out for them, and they too became slaves in Egypt. And thus we have the ongoing story of their crying out to God, and God actually leading them out of the slavery in Egypt through 
the Red Sea, in wandering in the wilderness, and eventually to the Promised Land. And when I stand there at the Eucharist with you every, every week, we allude to that story of the kind of freedom that God can offer us. And that's the freedom, my friends, that I want to say to you is available to each of us every moment, even when we make decisions that are unjust, cruel, or even evil. What I want to invite us to do is to see in new ways. So I also want to tell you a story about a woman who's no longer alive but was here in the parish when I first came. Aksha O'Donovan was very committed to this per person coming, this parish coming back to life after some difficult circumstances. And so she was among my best supporters when I first came. And I came in the fall of 2006, and the bishop comes by and actually does a service to help install me, if you will, and that happened in December. And so Aksha was among the people who said, let me help, and brought some food for a reception, and took it upon herself to be like an ambassador and to greet people. Now along the way, I had met our brothers and sisters from um, a, a mostly African-American Methodist church over on Cuba Road, Goff United Methodist. And they had come and sung at a funeral here, and I said, hey, you all, I'm going to have this installation service, and I don't really know any folks in the neighborhood. Would you be willing to come? And they did. So we had 10 or 12 people from that church, and so we all worshiped together, and then we all went over for the reception. And near the end of the reception, Aksha O'Donovan ran up to me laughing wildly, and she had a very irreverent sense of humor anyway, so I had no idea what kind of joke she might tell me. But she told me the story of what had just happened, and the story is this. While she was being a wonderful grand dame greeting everybody in the parish and trying to help them feel really welcome, she turned to this one young man who happened to be of African descent and greeted him and introduced herself. Hi, I'm Aksha O'Donovan. You know, I'm so glad you came here today, and gosh, and blah, right? And this young man looked her right in the eye and said, Mrs. O'Donovan, I bring in your wood. He worked for her. To her credit, she laughed at herself apologized, said, I don't know if I've ever looked at your face. I'm so sorry. And began a different kind of relationship with him and ran up to tell me because she thought that she was so both terrible and, well, you know, she, she, she said, you won't believe what I've done. Oh my gosh, listen to this story. We all are blind, like Aksha. I hope we're all as generous with ourselves when our blindness, be, we become aware of our blindness. I hope we also are self-reflective enough to say, wow, here I am thinking I'm such a good Christian, sort of like Frank in my first story. Oh, well, I do all these things, and I hang out with all these different kinds of people. You know, I don't know about this racism thing. I hope we're all a little bit like that. Because there's grief we cause each other. The part that got left out, if you see in that reading, there are a couple of verses in the beginning of the 45th chapter of Genesis. I don't know why the church won't let us read it. That parts are all about... It's, it's, it's sentence after sentence where Joseph is weeping. He is weeping so hard to discover his brothers and reveal himself that they say the whole court heard him crying out, weeping. He's connected to them, brothers. He's probably thought about them forever. Then they all weep on each other. They have several sentences in this, this part of the story all about the great grief that they have all carried, the barriers. Can you imagine being those brothers who no longer have to keep that secret from their father? They're able, he said, go back to my father and bring him here and tell him I am alive. And they are reunited and their line lives 
than in Egypt. So, I, I don't know. People changed, you know. Um, they, they found new ways. It wasn't that God made one thing happen and then that was terrible and so, you know, everybody, you know, groveled around and then decided that they ought to learn how to love. It was really that we, they were all human beings. They acted out of both their sinfulness and their blessedness and again and again, God was allowed to enter into their conversations and bring them back together. So that's, I think, our lesson for today, that um, God hasn't g given up on any of us yet, and that with God's help, we too can continue to be restored and forgiven, reconciled and free. Today's story is an invitation for us to keep listening, to keep paying attention, to keep opening our eyes, and to keep being willing to change. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you.